In this first technical session of the course, as we start to get into the syllabus, we're going to start off with something that's not too important for the exam, just to get us going, before we hit the big exam areas. The first areas we're going to look at, three of them, are what I would call regulatory issues, almost background issues, but your examiner expects you to have some knowledge of these, and they do come up from time to time. The first area we're going to look at is very much background and the least important of the three areas. And that is, how is the audit and accountancy industry regulated? And in that first area, we'll look at the roles of the ACCA, the institute that you're trying to join. We'll look at the roles of oversight bodies, the International Audit and Assurance Standards Board and what they get up to, and just get a feel for what the issues are and who does what. The second area we're going to look at, you might quite enjoy, because I'm going to teach you to launder money. Because if you know how criminals launder money, you're in a much better position to be able to spot a criminal doing it, which is your responsibility, I'm afraid. The third area we're going to look at is called laws and regulations. As you'll see... It's not laws and regulations for auditors, but the laws and regulations that affect our clients. The issue here is, if I'm auditing a company, how much am I expected to know about the detailed rules and regulations that affect my client? Obviously, I need to know the rules and regulations of accountancy, because that's what I'm checking, and I need to know the rules and regulations of auditing, because that's what I'm doing. But if I'm auditing a factory, how much do I need to know about the rules for factories? And why might I need to know that stuff? Because I can't possibly know the rules and regulations for every single industry, and I could have a list of clients from every single industry. So how does that work? Now, on this little list here of introductory subjects, the first one, regulation, not too important money laundering is becoming more and more important. So we'll spend a little time looking at how criminals launder money and what our responsibilities are. The third area, law and regulations, is actually on the F8 syllabus, but hardly ever seems to come up. It has come up once or twice over the years on this paper. Never for more than about four or five marks. So it's not a major area, but we should take a brief look at it. So let's start off by looking at the regulation that affects our industry, audit and accountancy. Now, of course, you have probably come across lots of sets of initials for different organisations who play some role in the regulation of accountants and auditors. And, of course, it's going to depend on which country you're in. There are some international bodies, like the IAASB, that we'll be looking at on this very short list. But if you're in, say, America, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, are going to be important to you. If you're in Britain, potentially the Financial Services Authority, the FSA, may be important to you. So do bear in mind that in each individual country, there are likely to be national regulators who carry out some roles. But what we're looking at here are two roles that are international, the ACCA and the IAASB. 
And the one in the middle, well, a professional oversight board exists in America. There's one in Britain. And there's one European. So this is a sort of body that may well apply in several different countries or jurisdictions. So a little taster of regulation then coming up, starting with the ACCA. Now, if you're going to join the ACCA, it might be a good idea to know what they do and what they can do to you, as well as what they can do for you. So why do we have a membership body called the ACCA? What do they actually do? Well, being a membership body, they are there to represent you, the member. So they're there to look after your interests, and that's part of the reason you'll pay them fees every year. But they are also responsible for monitoring what you get up to. So to a great extent, the ACCA are there to monitor behaviour and the quality of your work. And of course they do that in a number of ways. One way in which they monitor the quality of the people calling themselves accountants is of course the reason you're watching this video. They make you sit exams. Shame that, isn't it? Now, there's always been a bit of a problem with exams, hasn't there? You pass the exams, but the problem is, within a couple of years, the tax rules have probably changed, new accounting standards have come up, law has changed, maybe new auditing standards have come out. So, how can you pass the exams, and then maybe five years later still call yourself an accountant? Surely you've got to keep up to date. So therefore, the only sensible solution is that the ACCA make you sit the exams once, and then every five years, you've got to sit them again. Ah, got you. Can't believe you fell for that. Of course you don't keep sitting the exams. If it took you on average five years to pass them all, you'd never finish, would you? You'd keep having to restart them. That would be crazy behaviour. But on a serious note, we do need to keep you up to speed. So what the ACCA will do is set you the exams and then once you finish them, you're expected every year to do what is known as Continuing Professional Education, CPE, sometimes called CPD, Continuing Professional Development. You are expected to make sure that you are keeping up with changes for anything relevant to the work that you do. So if you're a general accountant or you work in auditing, you'll be going on courses for the rest of your natural-born lives. The good news is there's no exam at the end. Just attend, listen, ask questions, and keep on top of the changes. So the ACCA are largely there to check quality by setting exams, monitoring your CPE or CPD, and they're also likely to come round to your firm, if you're a registered firm of auditors or accountants, and actually look at examples of your work and make sure you're following the standards. So that's pretty much what the ACCA do. Uh, they can also help you, of course, by giving you advice if you're in a difficult professional situation. But most of the time, ACCA members probably don't actually trouble the ACCA itself too much. If the ACCA come knocking on your door, it could be bad news. Because if someone's complained about you, they may be about to carry out an investigation. The ACCA is not the government. They can't send you to prison. But they certainly can fine you. And if you've been very naughty, they might kick you out. And if they kick you out then you may have to do your exams again. Although, to be honest, if they kick you out, there'll probably be a condition saying you're never going to be an accountant again. So be good. What's a professional oversight board? Well, as we'll see when we look at auditor liability in another session, auditing has had a bit of a bad reputation over the last 15 to 20 years. Too many companies have suddenly gone bust too many companies have suffered frauds or had to reissue their accounts due to mistakes, and the auditors don't seem to have picked that up. Of course, probably the most famous example of this is Enron, where there are suspicions that the auditors not only didn't pick up the mistakes, but actually helped the directors put the mistakes in. 
Now, given that there has been a reputation issue with the quality of auditing, people have started to ask questions. And people have noted that in the past, most audit regulation was set by auditors. I mean, take the ACCA, for example. The ACCA set the exams and monitor the quality of the work that its members do. But who are the ACCA? They are the accountants. So it's accountants checking accountants. And, of course, that creates a bit of uncertainty, doesn't it? If you heard, for example, that uh, someone had fallen down the stairs at a police station, you might be a little worried that the police had pushed that person down the stairs to try and get them to talk, which, of course, is not the sort of thing we really want police officers doing. If you now hear that the police are going to carry out an investigation, you start to think, hang on a minute, this is the police investigating other police. They lack independence. And as such, if they now find the police have done nothing wrong, you look at their report and say, oh yeah, really? Well, if you don't believe the report, what's the point of having a report? The same is potentially true in the audit and accountancy industry. If all the regulation is being done by auditors and accountants, what assurance does that give the outside world that we're actually doing our work properly? So after Enron in the States, they came up with the concept of an oversight board. A group of people who may partly be accountants and auditors, but would also represent other stakeholders, like people from industry, maybe members of the public or government, to try to get some non-auditors monitoring the auditors. The concept of an oversight board bringing in non-accountants to monitor accountants has now been copied in Great Britain. Uh, as I said, there's also a European oversight board, and it may well be the case that we end up with something more global. The third one on the list is the International Audit and Assurance Standards Board, the IAASB. They are part of an umbrella body called IFAC, I-F-A-C, the International Federation of Accountants, who are based in New York. Why do we want to know about the International Audit and Assurance Standards Board? Well, as the name suggests, they produce international standards on how to do auditing, or ISAs, ISAs, as they're known. And, of course, international audit standards tell us how to carry out the audit process. So they are important. But does every country follow the international standards? Well, there has been a bit of a move in recent years, and more and more countries are now developing their own standards to match the international ones, or in some cases just using international standards. Now, naturally, in some countries... They might want to do things slightly differently, but the basics of auditing seem so sensible, the chances are most countries are auditing in a fairly similar way. And of course there are benefits if around the world all audits are done pretty much the same. Imagine, for example, if you are the auditor of a worldwide group of companies. If there's a subsidiary in Australia it needs to be audited in line with whatever the Australian auditing standards are. But if you're based, say, in Great Britain, because you're auditing the parent company, when you sign the consolidated accounts audit report and say the accounts are true and fair, you're going to say that the audit of the group has been carried out in line with, and then you're going to state the audit standards you followed. If the Australian auditors are doing something different, how are you assured that they've actually checked the accounts in a way that you're happy with? Wouldn't it be nice if every audit team around the world are doing the same things in the same way? There has got to be a major advantage to having a worldwide set of auditing standards. To give you an example, in Great Britain, we have adopted the international audit standards. Although we don't just follow them, we've created our own UK set so that if there are things in there in the future we don't like, we can slightly adapt them for the UK. 
But to be brutally honest, the UK standards are virtually identical to the international ones at the moment, and that's how it's likely to stay. I said earlier that the IAASB is part of a wider body called IFAC, the International Federation of Accountants. And it's worth knowing, maybe, that IFAC have also got an ethics board and they've set an international code of ethics. The logic here being that if we have the same international audit standards being done everywhere, maybe we could have the same code of ethical behaviour everywhere. Because... Ethics must be pretty similar around the world, surely. The problem with ethics is that behaviour around the world is not the same. And what is acceptable in one country might be considered very much unacceptable somewhere else. So to get an international code of ethics, which everyone's willing to follow, is a lot harder. Now, audit and accountancy, as we've seen, is regulated from a number of places. And we should bear in mind that with the increased importance of corporate governance, our clients may sort of be regulating us as well. Because if we're auditing a listed company, the chances are they've got an audit committee, a group of independent, non-executive directors, and part of their role is to make sure the quality and the independence of what we do as auditor is at a high enough level. So we may well find that as well as all these regulatory bodies telling us what to do, our clients may now be more likely to be telling us what to do as well. Not how to do the audit, but they might be saying, I'm not sure you should be auditing this company anymore. Something that in the past they weren't that likely to do. Okay, that's a little bit on regulation, largely background for this exam paper, but worth knowing. We're going to move on now to something I'm thinking you may find quite interesting, and that is money laundering. Now, before we get into why this is important to the course, let's just make sure we understand what money laundering is. Money laundering is taking the proceeds of criminal activity and doing something to try to make it look as though those proceeds have come from somewhere else. So if you want a very basic definition, it is hiding the true source of proceeds of crime. Now, as I said in an earlier video, there has been a big international push on this over the last 10 years or so. Most of the countries of the world, although not all, but most of the countries of the world have signed up to an international cooperation agreement so that we're trying to roll out similar ideas in all of those countries to try to stamp this out. And it needs to be an international effort Because if you want to hide the sources of funds, one way to do it is to move those funds into other countries, move them around a bit, and then bring them back. Because if you can take your money through countries where there are no anti-money laundering provisions, or there are very strong privacy laws, the chances are anyone investigating your money loses the trail when it hits that country. And in a wider sense, the more you move money around, the harder it is to find out where the initial source was. So, that's what money laundering is. Potentially, it may involve accountants and auditors. Your clients might want you to try and help them hide their money, so you may know they're criminals. Or you may unwittingly help them, because you may give them advice on how to set up companies, groups of companies, how to invest money and not realise that its true source is criminal. As auditors especially, we will be looking at company documentation, company events, and it may be there are clues in what the company is doing that tell us there's a problem. So, what are the responsibilities of a firm of accountants when it comes to money laundering?
Firstly, firms of accountants are expected to appoint an MLRO, a money laundering reporting officer. This is likely to be someone at partner level, so as senior as it gets. The logic is this. If a fairly junior member of the firm sees something that they think is suspicious, there is a danger that if they now report this to an outside body, what they're reporting is in fact not money laundering at all. Their lack of experience and knowledge has made them jump to the wrong conclusions. OK, well, to be too careful is better than not to be careful enough. But the danger now is that the authorities are sent lots of reports which are frankly rubbish which means that real money laundering might go and be missed. So the idea is that in a firm of accountants, one person, the MLRO, is responsible for reporting things to the relevant authorities. If you work for a firm of accountants and you spot something that makes you suspicious, you tell the MLRO and then leave them to deal with it so that someone who is experienced and knowledgeable can take the appropriate action. So, stage one, appoint an MLRO. Stage two. As I've said, this is all about where people have got their money from, the true source of funds. Therefore, for all of your clients, you are expected to have what is known as KYC procedures. Know your client. Make sure you know their true identity, and make sure you understand where they get their money from. Now, there were times when you would ask your client, where is this money from? They would give you a story, and you'd nod a lot. In your mind, you'd think, that doesn't sound very likely, but you'd go on the theory that if you don't ask any more questions, you won't find out anything nasty. You're not allowed to do that. You are expected to show some probity, to probe, to find out the truth. If it sounds suspicious, it probably is suspicious. If your client says, I earn this money in a company in Indonesia, fine. Let's see some records to prove this is the facts. You can't just take everything and assume it's true. Now, obviously, you need to be a bit careful with this. Because if you start demanding evidence from clients as to where they get their money from and who they really are, your relationship with this client might not be that good. But the fact is, it's a bit like opening a bank account now. Just as when you go to a bank, they demand passports, fingerprints, a pint of blood and your left arm, well, to an extent, you have to do this with clients. We're going to need to see passports from directors, certificates of incorporation to prove that this company exists and the directors are who they say they are. OK, we now have some KYC procedures. We've checked out this new client. We know who they are. We think we understand why they're earning money. The next thing to do is to realise that all of our staff in our firm of accountants may come into contact with clients. And therefore, if you want them to be able to spot the clues, you're going to have to tell them what the clues are. In other words, we need some training. And that will probably involve everybody in the firm. Anyone who could come into contact with clients, be it professional staff who are seeing their documents, maybe even the receptionists who first meet the clients when they come through the door, all might be capable of spotting behaviour that suggests a suspicion. So, the question is, what sort of clues might make you worried that money laundering might be going on? Now, as far as this is concerned, we can probably split it into two. Situations where you should be more worried that money laundering might go on 
although if you've got an honest client, hopefully it won't be. So what are the sort of situations that create more risk? And then actual things your client might be doing that suggest they might be money laundering. Let's first consider situations that might create more risk. OK, remember, money laundering is where people are hiding the true source of the proceeds of crime, money they shouldn't have. So can we think of a situation, first of all, where we may have some types of client who have access to money that they shouldn't have? Well, you could argue any company director has access to company funds that probably don't belong to them, but that's a bit general. One specific example that's actually come up on the exam paper is the concept of having clients who have some sort of political involvement. Because, of course, if your client is, say, a member of parliament, maybe even the president of a country, and someone's got to look after their accounts, bear in mind they've probably got access to public funds, taxpayers' money. I'm not saying they would steal it. All I'm saying is that history has taught us that when you give politicians access to people's money, sometimes they're not the most honest people in the world. They may, of course, have started honest. But if you give someone the keys to a cupboard that's got $300 trillion in it, well, the temptation may be too much. So if you've got any clients who are somehow involved in politics, what we might call politically exposed persons, PEPs, that should make you think maybe there is a greater risk of money laundering. I'm not saying they are doing it. Just check a bit more carefully about where they genuinely earn their money. Any rich politician should make you a little nervous, unless they can prove why they're rich. OK, so there's one situation where you need to be a bit careful, but that's a fairly specific situation and it doesn't arise very often. What about something a bit more general? Well, let's think about this. Money laundering is about having cash you shouldn't have and then hiding it somehow. Well, if you're going to set up a company or some sort of organisation, bring your cash into it, put it through the company somehow so it looks like the company is earning this money, presumably a cash-based company would make this easier. Because anything where people are paying on credit, bank transfer, something like that, is going to mean that at some point your illegal money is going to have to go through bank accounts. And the problem with bank accounts is that just as accountants are asking where is your money coming from, so are banks. A little tip here, if you were selling drugs last night and have a million dollars in your pocket, please don't go and open a bank account with it, because by the time you've given your name, the police will arrive and want to know where your million dollars comes from. Oh, and another little tip, I am reliably informed that drugs tend to stick to banknotes, so if they check your million dollars out, I think you're going to get caught, aren't you? Anyway. Probably shouldn't be telling you this, should I? But there we go, that's the sort of things to look out for. So a cash-based business creates a great opportunity to do some money laundering. Now, there are a lot of cash-based businesses out there, so let's investigate that with an example. Right, let's consider a cash-based business that might be really good for laundering money. Now, the logic is this. I'm going to create a company... I'm then going to take the money that I shouldn't have from robbing the bank last night or selling drugs or maybe both. And I'm going to put that money into the company and claim that the company has sold something. This is therefore the sales revenue of the company. If I can make it look like this sales revenue is legitimate, it's honestly earned, I can now take the profits of the company back out, 
pay myself a dividend as the owner of the company, and I've now earned that cash in what appears to be a legitimate way. I can put it in the bank, I can spend it, I can buy a car, buy a house, and no one will check. Now immediately we see an interesting point here. If I set up a company and pay this illegal money into the company, by the time it gets down to profit and then dividends, surely it's going to be taxed. Which means I may start with 10 million of drugs money, and by the time it's gone through the company, the profit may only be half that, or maybe less. But the thing is, as a criminal, that's great, I don't mind. I'm willing to give up half my illegal money on the basis that the rest of it that I keep, the other half, I can now spend however I like. It's worth it. It's a bit like if you were to go and rob someone's house and steal their Rolex watch worth £5,000, you'd be quite happy to go down to the local pub and sell it to someone for 1000 OK, it's worth 5000 But if you try and sell it for its real value, it takes longer. And if you're selling it in a legitimate manner, people are more likely to ask questions about where you got this watch from, like why is there no paperwork with it? Where's the invoice from when you bought it? Of course, down the pub, a cheap Rolex might be worth buying. The fact that it's stolen, well, if your buyer doesn't ask, they don't know. So just as a thief is more likely to sell what they've stolen on the cheap, so a money launderer is quite happy to pay tax. Rather ironically, this does mean that the government of every country is raising tax revenue from money launderers. Part of the tax revenues are the proceeds of crime. Which rather ironically means that when the government spends that money, it is basically hiding the proceeds of crime. In other words, every government is laundering money. I think we should report them, don't you? Anyway, ignoring that little side issue, which is amusing but doesn't really help us pass the exam, let's go back to this idea of a cash-based business. Now, you see we have a problem here. Let's say I open a shop. I now put my drugs money in the till and say I've sold something. Problem is, anyone investigating this will be able to see that I didn't buy any products and sell them to anybody. If I claim to have sold things, goods, products, it's fairly easy to tell if those products were ever purchased by me. Hmm. Now, I suppose I could open a completely legitimate shop, and every time I buy something, I could put through a little bit of extra cash and claim that I bought a bit more. But the problem is, the more I do this, the more it's going to show up. What would be ideal is to set up a cash-based business where what I'm selling are not goods that are easy to track, but services. So, for example, how about I set up an accountancy training college and tell the customers, the students who come on my courses, I'm quite happy to accept checks, bank transfers, credit cards, or cash. Now, if I set up my courses in an appropriate way, I may well attract not just students from the country, but international students who want to travel and come and study. And if you're an international student, say, coming to London, the chances are you may not have set up a bank account yet, which means there's a reasonable chance that you will want to pay for your course in cash. So what is to stop me, the money launderer, opening an accountancy training college and when I do a class with 10 students in the room, I add another 30 or 40 names to the list and claim there were 50 students in the room. I work out what 40 course fees would come to, take my drugs money and put 40 lots of course fees from it into the company's bank account. Pay it in and just claim it's students on courses. Now imagine you're an investigator checking me out. I had 10 students in the room, I'm claiming there were 50. How can you tell? Well, I suppose if you were actually there, you'd know. So one obvious thing to do is to visit companies where you're worried money laundering is going on and see what the real level of activity, the real amount of business going on, actually is. 
Of course, if I know you're coming, I'll make sure there are 50 people in the room, because I'll bribe a few people to turn up. So it's best to turn up unannounced, really, isn't it? And not just once, a few times. I suppose you could interview students who are allegedly on the course. If I've invented 40 people, when you write to them or phone them up, they won't be there. But of course, if I've got 10 million of drugs money to hide, I've got a bit of spare cash, haven't I? And presumably what I'll do is pay a few people to be my fake students, so that if you write to them or phone them up, they've been paid by me to give you the right answer. Yes, I was there. The thing with the services industry is there aren't that many obvious things to track. I mean, if you come on an accountancy course, you'll have course material. But if I just photocopy that in my office, rather than paying an outside person to print it up for me, it wouldn't be that hard to make it look like I'm photocopying lots of material. Just photocopy blank pieces of paper. So you see, with a bit of thought, setting up an accountancy college or any other sort of college might prove a very good way of money laundering. Because as long as my normal students pay in cash, it wouldn't look odd to have more students who don't really exist paying in cash, would it? Now, that, of course, is one of the reasons why there are so many colleges out there. I'm afraid to say some of them, maybe, if there are any lawyers watching, some of them may actually be money laundering operations. And it would be an interesting experiment to turn up at one of these colleges and just see how much is actually going on. Are there really any students there? So you see how the authorities have got a problem here. There are plenty of businesses where it's not that difficult to come up with a very good reason why you've got stacks of cash on the premises. Now, money laundering has been going on for a very long time. I've used an accountancy training college for the simple reason that I work at an accountancy training college, so I can see how it might be done. I'm not a money launderer, by the way, just in case you're wondering, as if I'd tell you anyway. Um, what other sorts of businesses have been used in the past for laundering money? Well, if you go back to 1920s, 30s America, there was a lot of money laundering, gangs, crime going on then. And a very popular way of doing it was to use a casino. Because, of course, if you've got a casino, there's a very strong chance that people turned up last night, gambled and lost. Which means you've got a great excuse for having money on the premises. And the sort of people who go to casinos may well gamble a lot of money. You could easily argue that someone turned up last night and lost a million dollars. Which means you've got a million dollars of drugs money and you've already got an excuse. This is one of the reasons why, typically, casinos have had quite tight rules, whereby they have to have members. You're not allowed in if you're not a member. So that we can actually track who's going to casinos, so the investigators would have some hope of knowing if people had lost money. But potentially, a casino is a very good way of claiming to have funds that actually you've generated illegally. Now, you may not believe this, but another reason why money laundering is called money laundering is there is another cash-based services industry which is great for laundering money. A laundrette. A laundry. I mean, everyone pays in cash, don't they? So what you could do is open up a big laundrette with loads of washing machines in, which obviously is going to cost you a bit, and then you pay some of your staff, your gang members, your fellow criminals, to sit there all day and just put coins into the machines. Good idea to buy machines that actually register how much cash has gone through, because that then proves that people were washing their clothes. Nope. All that's happening is that people are putting money in purely to make it look like people are washing clothes. Now, use a bit of common sense here. Do bear in mind, if the investigators turn up and you claim to have a laundrette that is turning over five million a week, that if the, all the machines look brand new and have clearly never been used, it's going to look a bit obvious. So sensible tactic, buy second-hand machines, which will also be cheaper, of course. And it might be wise if every so often some of your gang do actually wash their clothes. It will also make them smell better. So there we go. Cash-based businesses, especially in the services sector, are a very good way of hiding the true source of money.
OK, so there are some examples of situations where an accountant should have their eyes a little bit more open and their brains a bit more switched on. Because they are situations where money laundering would be easier to do. I'm not saying they're doing it. Just be aware it could be done. Getting a bit more specific now, what sort of clues might indicate in any business that money laundering is going on? OK, so some clues. What might make you think, hmm, this makes me nervous? Well, remember, a money launderer is trying to hide the true source of money. If you don't want someone to see something, best tactic, move it around as much as possible. So if you're looking at a transaction, and it looks like the transaction could have been as simple as X paying Y, but instead it's gone from X to W to P to A to B to C to D, back to W again, and then gone to Y, you should probably ask yourself, why is this happening? So any transactions where, as far as you're concerned, it's just too complicated. It didn't need to be like that. Now, it's not just transactions. It's business structures as well. If you're auditing a group of companies or a network of associated companies, which just looks so complicated when surely they could have done it all in one company or one company in a subsidiary, ask yourself the question, why have they set this up like this? And are there lots of transfers between the companies? This could be an attempt to hide what's really going on. As we noted earlier, there are some countries in the world which have not signed up to this great plan to try to reduce money laundering. If your client is taking money from your country and sending it through some of these slightly, how shall we call them, um, dodgy countries, maybe that's an indication that the money is going in, but something's actually happening there before it comes out the other side. Maybe this is an attempt to cloud what's really going on. In a more general sense, any transaction that you are looking at and either not understanding or you're questioning the whole business purpose of it, what are they doing and why are they doing this, should set a few alarm bells going. If you don't understand why it's happening and there are no obvious reasons for it, maybe there are no obvious reasons for it. So bear that in mind. Now, one little warning. To help encourage accountants to do the right thing and report clients where we think there might be a problem, there are some fairly severe legal penalties if you don't report. But it gets worse than that. If, when you are suspicious, you let your client know that you are suspicious, if your client is a crook, they'll either create lots of fake paperwork to hide what they're doing, or, of course, they may run away with the evidence. If you tip them off, you could stop them ever being prosecuted because they run away. To stop you tipping off your clients that you know what's happening, there are criminal penalties for that as well. You must somehow report your suspicions without your client finding out. And that is going to create a few problems.
For example, imagine you are at a client and you've spotted something that looks suspicious. You think there are transactions that are there purely to hide money laundering and have nothing to do with the actual business. Well, the problem is, if they're not business transactions, they shouldn't be in the financial statements. If it's money laundering, I'm presuming it's material, by nature, if not by size, which means you think the accounts are not true and fair. Problem is, the moment you tell the client and explain that you think that the accounts are wrong, you're going to have to tell them why, which means if they're doing this on purpose and they are criminals, you're tipping them off. So don't tell the client. Brilliant. How do you sign the audit report? You can't say the accounts are true and fair, because that would be lies. And you can't say they're not true and fair, because if you do, you have to explain in the audit report why, which means the client reads it and they're tipped off. The problem is, can you actually finish the audit? If you can't sign the audit report, what do you do? I mean, you could try and delay it long enough for the regulators to get involved, but if the client thinks, why are you delaying it, they might consider that you've probably caught on to what they're doing. You're tipping them off. OK, I can't finish the audit. Resign. What do you tell the client? You can't tell them the truth because it's tipping them off. You can't lie to them because that's unethical. You could, I suppose, tell them nothing. Say there is some conflict of interest or legal issue and it's too sensitive to talk about. And that might be your best solution. Although, of course, you've got to be very careful what you say because if they're intelligent, and most money launderers are not idiots, even that might tip them off. Bear in mind that even simply being at a client, seeing what you think is criminal activity, and turning bright red and going, oh my God, money laundering, I've never seen this before, is enough to make your client think, why are you turning red and getting excited? Somehow you have to keep calm. Somehow you've got to deal with this without your client finding out. Very difficult. Now, of course, there are other issues as well when money laundering is happening. For example, if you were to resign, presumably your client will look for new accountants, new auditors. And as part of the handover process, we have something called professional clearance which means the new auditors are going to write to you and say, why did you resign? Is there anything we should know before we take on this client? Presumably, you'd like to tell them you're worried about money laundering. Are you allowed to tell them? Or is this breaching client confidentiality? I mean, nothing's been proved yet. Difficult. Very, very difficult. And the result of this is that the auditing authorities have tried to come up with a bit of guidance as to how you should deal with this very difficult ethical situation. So there we go. That is money laundering. It's a very interesting area in the real world, and there are plenty of types of business where it could be going on under your nose. In fact, it probably is, and you don't see it. Unfortunately, these days, it is the responsibility of auditors to report their suspicions, and unfortunately, to report suspicions you should have had. Which means coming up with the excuse, I didn't see what was happening, will only work if a judge agrees that you shouldn't have seen it. If the judge thinks you should have seen it, I'm afraid ignorance is not going to get you off this time. You are in big trouble. So this needs to be taken seriously when you work as an accountant. You cannot, as maybe we used to do, turn a blind eye to clients who seem to have too much money for no apparent reason. And bear in mind, if you start asking too many questions about where they're getting their money from, you could be tipping them off, couldn't you? Horrible, horrible area. OK, that's money laundering. Uh, it doesn't come up a huge amount. Just make sure you're aware of what it is. Make sure you're aware of the types of business where it might be more likely to happen. And in an exam, if you're presented with an odd-looking story, just keep your mind open to the fact that maybe what you're seeing is money laundering.